Bree had asked me uh, a while back to give a title to the uh, panel discussion. I chose, what did I choose? <laughs> the faith and Reason in Service to the Sick and Dying. And the reason why I chose that title is simply because a number of the questions are on the end of, end of life issues. But the difficulty is that, as you recall during his pontificate, St. John Paul II was a major champion of the, uh, the necessary interplay between faith and reason in coming to many important uh, moral decisions. And I think the problem with in a, the contemporary American culture that's become so secular, that one reason why they, 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 don't, they do not want the Catholic Church to become involved in addressing issues uh, that have profoundly important moral dimensions is because so many people are convinced that the church has this private, sectarian, bizarre morality that we try to impose on our secular culture. And that, that, of course, is not the case. And especially in the field of uh, moral theology and, and ethics, that so many of the church's positions are based on natural moral, re moral uh, reason, reasoning. So it's not a sectarian. It's a type of uh, intellectual discipline, intellectual reflection on moral issues that can be attained by any pe per person who wants to do this reflection without prejudice or, or sort of a type of animus against faith. So that's a little background of what, uh, why we chose the title of Faith and Reason in Service to the Sick and Dying. What we'll do is each of us on the panel this afternoon will uh, raise a question that has been given to us and we'll make an attempt to answer it. And I invite the panelists, uh, when anyone finishes his or her answer, if there's something that needs to be added, please jump, jump in. So let me begin. The question, first question that I received is this. So many nurses, aides, and doctors, in my experience, almost ignore those patients and families who are dying. No one talks about palliative care. In this precious time of life, what can we do to make sure that patients and families get the treatment and attention they need and deserve? <coughs> Some of you may be familiar with the rather tragic situation uh, that happened several months ago. A very attractive, young, vibrant woman named Brittany Maynard made the decision very publicly that she was going to uh, have a physician-assisted suicide or uh, end her life by um, obviously taking some type of drugs. And, and she did that. And the way it was pre uh, written up in the media, it was with great sympathy for Brittany's decision. And that has really re-energized the national debate on physician-assisted suicide. And I think at the present time, there are about 20-some legislatures, including the legislature here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that is going to be addressing the public policy issue of physician-assisted suicide. So it's a matter that we have to give some reflection to. As a matter of fact, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, just a couple of years ago, there was a, a referendum of, of, on the issue of physician-assisted suicide. And when the referendum began here in the Commonwealth, the support for uh, physician-assisted suicide was overwhelming. And in the course of a year, year and a half, uh, with a, a lot of education, we actually defeated that uh, referendum, I think, by two percentage points, which was bordered on the miraculous, thanks be to God. So it's, uh, it was a great, great pro-life um, victory. But the, the point is this, that, um, again, this, this, this misinformation about the church's pos uh, position, that some people think that, uh, that when a person is dying, he or she has to use every possible technological intervention to keep that person alive. And that's not the case. Obviously, the church teaches that the gift of human life is a fundamental, but not an absolute good. And that sometimes, because of medical situations, that a person can, in fact, uh, be allowed to die because the burdens that are imposed upon the, the, by the illness uh, outweigh the benefits that medical intervention could, uh, could provide. So the, the, we, the church does not teach vitalism. But however, the most recent uh, that I'm aware of, uh, articulation of the church's position on end-of-life care, specifically in terms of uh, uh, artificial nutrition, hydration, and provision thereof, was made in March of 2004, when St. John Paul II issued an allocutio in Rome to a number of healthcare providers on this specific issue. And the church's position is that uh, in end-of-life situations, 
that in terms of provision of artificial hydration, which is another question, that in principle, the, the doctor, the Holy Father said that it, it must be provided uh, to, uh, to dying people uh, if the ends for which it is, the medical intervention is begun, if those ends can successfully be met. But in terms of palliative care, I think that the church is, I know, the church is very, very supportive of it, as long as the practitioners of the palliative care uh, are committed not to doing anything that would hasten the death. You cannot deliberately make a decision to end someone's life. But other than that, I think with the intention of trying to alleviate suffering and, and to help the person to prepare him and herself in order to meet God, that's a great type of uh, consolation for the dying person, for the family. And basically, it's a, I would say it's a type of physical and spiritual accompaniment. So that's how I'd, uh, I'd ask, answer that first question on what can we do for the patients and families in these uh, end of life situations? Anyone have anything to say? The second question is, uh, when the in vitro embryos are frozen for years, what's happening to their souls? When people have one embryo implanted and destroyed the rest, how does the church view this? Um, very simply, the first, I mean the second question, is any destruction of life is like killing the unborn, still the same at the earliest level because the moment they are um, and become embryos, they're already considered to be human, person at its earliest stage. So therefore, it is the destruction of life. The, um, the first question regarding the, uh, the souls, as you know, the, um, the, tri the three agents, when it comes to human life, you know, the. Uh, the man, woman, and God. We have the beginning of life, but God is the giver, creator of soul. And um, frozen for the Lord. In God, there's timelessness. They're real, they exist. Frozen does not mean it's, it's from a human perspective. They're, they're you know, um, frozen in time for us. But to God, they're always alive. And so there will be a time when if the electricity were to break down, whatever, you know, there the Lord calls them back to himself. Um, because, you know, they're potentially alive, they're frozen. And yet there, you know, there's a life there. So what happens to the souls? Well, the Lord will call us back. And then one day, the, from our perspective, as his from a Judeo-Christian perspective, they're human beings at the early stages. We'll see how the Lord brings them into that cool humanity. You know, but no one is outside of God. No one is outside of His salvation. Just one word to give a theological context to the question of frozen embryos. I would say uh, the question of what does one do with frozen embryos is probably one of the thorniest uh, theological, moral theological questions at the present time. And uh, there is a school of thought that uh, upholds what is called um, embryo, frozen embryo adoption. And there are, th there are Catholic, uh, uh, faithful Catholic moral theologians who argue for the um, supportability of, of a couple rescuing these frozen embryos and bringing them to term and uh, to the gift of, of full life outside the womb. But there are other respected moral theologians in the Catholic community that uh, are against it. And interestingly enough, the most recent document on, um, on assisted reproductive technologies, if I'm not mistaken, the Roman document came from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, says it's almost an insolvable situation. So that's just a little context for the discussion that's going on in the church at the present time. And the uh, congregation, the Holy Father has not made, or the congregation has not made a definitive judgment on which, what moral theological position will, will win the day. But it's very much in discussion in the uh, theological community at the present time. 
This question was directed to me. The unity of the soul has been defined as a truth of faith. That is, spirit and soul are really just two aspects of one reality, the human soul. And the references to the Catechism number 367, which refers to the Fourth Council of Constantinople. In light of this, how are we to understand the reflections of Father Montague, which seem to suggest a division and a duality in the soul? Well, we read in the Catechism, sometimes the soul is distinguished from the spirit. St. Paul, for instance, prays that God may sanctify his people wholly with spirit and soul and body, and kept sound and blameless at the Lord's coming. And it continues, the church teaches that this distinction does not introduce a duality into the soul. Spirit signifies that from creation, man is ordered to a supernatural end and that his soul can gratuitously be raised beyond all it deserves to communion with God. Well, in the scriptures in Genesis, we read, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So we see that the basic our act of creation was the inbreeding of the spirit into the dust. And then this, uh, for what God formed out of the dust, became a living soul. So there is no duality, but it is uh, the, the very life of the soul is the divine spirit. And therefore, uh, the, the spirit is given us as the connection between us and God. The soul is the means by which this life is lived out with intellect, will, and emotions. And the, these must be in control by the Holy Spirit if the, if the soul is to function properly. My question is, would you comment on the current trend in the workplace in which a supervisor is not to discuss religion and pro-life, respect life issues with staff members under their supervision? This directive was made by a labor relations attorney. Well, how do you say joint commission? Uh, the joint commission specifically requires that a spiritual assessment be done for every single patient that's receiving care under the Joint Commission guidelines. And the Joint Commission accredits every single agency in the United States and those internationally that are affiliated with them if they receive any kind of federal funding. So it's a huge impetus to have the staff trained appropriately on how to address spiritual assessment end of life issues, and they absolutely need to be trained. So whoever uh, put forward this question, I would do a formal complaint to the Joint Commission, go to the website, and there is a portal for making an anonymous complaint. If you want to do it so that you're recognized, you can also do so. But this is absolutely not allowed by Joint Commission guidelines to try to intimidate staff or in any way prohibit the spiritual care of the patient. It's required. And also for rehabilitation facilities, CARF requires it. As you all know, that's the accrediting agency. And I went as far as called the Joint Commission for clarification, and I spoke to CARF in Washington, D.C., and they sent me the documents. So I am positive. It's also in the nurse's book. Um, Nursing with the Hands of Jesus, a guide to nurses for the divine mercy that I wrote several years ago. And uh, that's what to do. Thank you. I have a question for Marie. 
Uh, as I travel around, occasionally healthcare professionals come up to me and state that exact same problem. Uh, is there currently something on your website that guides these people that this could be like the national place to go to get direction because people, you know, this is great, this crowd here, but this is only 150 people. All over the country, the same thing's happening. Uh, if you have, do you have something on the website? And if not, is that something that might be done in the near future? Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's an excellent question because I actually get emails and letters from all over the country and I have to talk to my wonderful friends in the internet department at the Marion Helper Center. But yes, we can do something. Uh, we have the website for the healthcare professionals and I am in the process of upgrading and developing certain aspects and we're actually going to be asking uh, physicians and other nurses that are experts in their area to also contribute, also Father Jermaine Kopasinski. But on that particular area, yes, I, I will be developing that. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, that there are some other resources out there for you to know about. Um, for instance, We've heard speak about the Pope Paul VI Institute for the Study of Human Reproduction in Omaha. For the Study of Human Reproduction in Omaha. And um, they have the Center for uh, Bioethics there. They actually call it the Center for, I'm sorry, the microphone goes on and on. The Center for Naproethics. And um, Sister Renee Merckx runs that. And uh, you could contact her through the Pope Paul VI PaulVI.com. Maybe PaulVIInstitute.com. I'm going in and out. Is this better? Oh, yes. Sorry. So I was saying PaulVIInstitute.com. Uh, they have the Center for uh, Naproethics. And this center has been remarkable in reaching out across the country to legal groups that are willing to support health professionals, basically without charge. You know, if you if you ask and fight for it, uh, they'll, they'll support you without charge. And and they have a list. And Sister Renee can connect you to the people that will support you in arguing with a CEO or a colleague or a supervisor. It can go that route if you need it to. I know of a nurse practitioner student who went all the way through her training one month shy and the group kicked her out. And they wouldn't give her any credit for the time that she spent there. So she had to start all over in another program um, because of her views on contraception. So anyway, there's resources out there. Another one that comes to my mind is One More Soul, um, especially in the pro-life world. Um, it's www omsoul.com. They have a list of uh, pro-life doctors and nurse practitioners all over the country. So you can check it out by your own region and find somebody that can support you in that. I've had several calls for people at different parts of the country that say, you know, I'm up against this. My supervisor or my CEO or the lead physician says such and such, and I need to keep my mouth shut or I will lose my job. It's not appropriate. They need to work around you. If you have a conscience stand that prevents you from participating in something that this institution is doing, then they have to find a way to work around you. Not that you have to capitulate to their way of thinking. I have a question. I will read it. Is it true that God wishes us to be well? It follows up with, in the early days of the church, the apostles and disciples prayed with people for healing and miracles that happened. In today's church, this does not seem to be practiced, except in the anointing of the sick. How can this be brought down to the parish level so people in general can know that they can pray for healing for others? God does wish us to be well. And as I read this question, my first thought was the Gospel of Luke, 
Luke, who we know was a physician, and in this gospel in particular, the healing stories of Jesus seem to just jump out of the page. Indeed, the Greek word for heal and save are very similar and often used interchangeably. In terms of how this is played out in our churches, it can be variable. I can speak to, I can give a quick little vignette of what has happened in my home church, which is a large congregational church, that we introduced healing services into our liturgical routine. And this was difficult at first. We had a pastor introduce it years ago, and we felt like it was a, at first, like it was an interruption in the privacy of worship. And a minister with a deacon would stand up front and invite people forward, much as in a communion line, for healing prayers, and spend a few minutes laying on hands in a private and very meaningful moment in prayer. And my attitude at first was that I thought I would have to have a cancer diagnosis or something ultimate happening to me to go up in the line. And even feeling like, well, I'm not gonna go up in line. But as time has gone on, these services have, have become so, so busy with people coming forward that we now have to have four or five stations. And people bring to us every care of their heart. They ask us to pray for them when a pet has died or over the illness of a child. It is a very real way to bring the healing ministry of Jesus right to people and to honor the time needed for healing right in worship. But in other churches, of course, there are communion ministers that are sent out into the hospitals to care for people. We have a pastoral care team that works alongside the pastor. And when people are just home from medical procedures or need meals there is an organizing network to bring meals to that person's house so i think there are a lot of ideas out there to help bring the healing hands of jesus into our homes and during our worship i i, I want to just add a couple of things one is the uh, anointing of the sick obviously is um, is a powerful reality for us. It is a sacrament, not only healing, but also forgiving of sins. But as you know, if you're Catholic, quite a few churches, just like uh, Alan was speaking, we have what is called healing masses, and they're very well attended. Wherever they show up, it seems like there's just no parking places. <laughs> the churches are packed, you know, for two overflowing, which means that people realize that there's more um, I, I know, again, from a Catholic perspective, uh, many times after Masses uh, or services, uh, people come to us, ask for blessing, for healing, um, more so in the like Filipino, Latino communities rather than Anglo. We don't seem to have, uh, maybe, maybe it's just a personal feeling, like I don't want to share or whatever, but we do have that. Um, people come to shrines not just Lourdes, but even in our place in Stockbridge. If I have a, like afternoon mass for the pilgrims, sometimes I say, you know, people have received a lot of graces here. And then it was just two weeks ago, I just said, you know, pray, pray, ask the Lord for grace. And three people showed up immediately after mass. He said, I came here in Thanksgiving because I had a, a, a tumor in my brain, cancer's tumor, and I was healed. And I came here to give thanksgiving to God. Um, another person who had breast cancer who also said, I have to come here because I want to offer God Thanksgiving. Usually, uh, it, is, it is not just, uh, you know, people, people come and show up, but they want to spend time in prayer, go to confession, receive the Eucharist. It's always like a spiritual renewal as part and parcel of that. So it does happen. Um, you know, I, I remember one lady who came to a church and uh, this was, I did a morning mass, but she says, you know, my husband and I and her daughter were there. And she said, you know, when I received the Eucharist, I asked the Lord, he says, please help me, please heal me. She had a, what is called a hypertension, it would spike up into 200s level, of blood, you know, blood pressure spike up. And within an hour, she would have several of those. She was afraid of getting a stroke or heart attack. 
And so she said she asked the Lord and she experienced a sort of sense of, of, of warmth passing through her body and it stopped. I don't know, it was permanent condition healing? I don't know, but it was next day. She says, I haven't had this recur since that moment. And once again, you know, I'm a little bit of prejudice with the special graces of healing because at the shrine people come often and tell us I'm not saying that this is the norm. However, there's a lot of people who receive a lot of graces. And, and you know, so I am sort of biased in favor of that. Some people tell me, you just around too many people who receive these spiritual healings and therefore you're a little bit off. Your statistics are wrong. But I'll tell you, the good Lord seems to be doing a lot of things by the path of healing, blessing, um, people praying to you with each other together. You know, uh, there's like group prayer groups. So it happens and it does, but it does require from us to seek, to seek the grace. Well, if I might, I just wanted to add that uh, in a book I was given recently, The Seven Secrets of Confession, Vinnie mm -hmm. Flynn talks about the sacrament being a healing sacrament. As a Catholic all my life, I didn't realize that until I read that. Shame on me. But I think there are a lot of people who don't realize the healing. It's not about confessing our sins. Jesus knows all our sins, but coming before him to receive his healing power through forgiveness. So I just thought yeah, that. Thank you for that witness. And I, well, just one more small, small, small token the psychosomatic dimensions, which, you know, this morning there were talks, including Brian and, and, uh, and Dr. Sobex mentioned. You know what happens to us, the stress, everything else, the guilt, the guilt that we carry. Sometimes I, I have heard confessions because of abortion and people have carried that guilt for 15, 20, sometimes longer years. You know, the dimension of healing that comes from a confession that God forgives. They don't have to beat themselves up. Sometimes there's really no need to even give penance because they carry it with such brokenness and it took them years to face it with courage to confess it because they didn't want to, you know, it's a wounded soul, wounded heart, and that happens. It, so there's a grace that comes, as you said, from sacrament of, of penance. All those things are there. So I know this is a bigger topic. Maybe we still have plenty of questions here, but but so true. God is the source. He is a physician, a truly a, a physician of both bodies and soul, souls and body, both. I thank Ellen very much for one thing she mentioned, that we need to understand. She said that healing and salvation come from the same root. And when you look into the dictionary, uh, both the Latin and the Greek, uh, the first meaning of salus is healing and health. And so, um, salvation does not only mean the forgiveness of sins and union with God, but it uh, covers all our um, relationships. Jesus won salvation for us. It's a done deal. And when we read um, uh, in Isaiah, by his wounds, we are healed. It's not we're going to be. We are healed. And St. Peter repeats that in his letter. By his wounds, we are healed. And so it's a done deal. But like, if you've got money in the bank, it's no good if you don't go in to take it out of there when you need it. And so here, salvation is ours, but we need to go and accept it. And uh, this is why when people come to healing services, they come with faith. That means I believe God's word and I act upon it. If I say I believe, but I don't act upon it, I really don't believe. And therefore God can't do anything. As he couldn't do much in Nazareth when he says there was not enough faith there for him to be able to truly uh, let uh, his uh, powers work. And so we have everything we need for salvation in every dimension of our existence, but we have to uh, accept it.
we have to reach out for it and ask for it. Well, from the uh, sublime to the more mundane. <laughs> My question is, are there any age limits to starting NAPA? The short answer is, don't wait too long. <laughs> we, we know that uh, fertility declines after age 35, and it's a steady decline from there. I think the oldest uh, patient I had who responded to NAPA was in her early 40s, and I've had some women come to me who are past 45, and I kind of cringe. I look at the, I look at the age, and I know that there's a very low likelihood that this person will achieve pregnancy. There are some testing, you know, blood tests that can be done uh, that will give you an idea of how much ovarian reserve there is, but really, you need to get started, um, ideally, before age. 35. I think of one, one woman in particular uh, who she had had an abortion as a young woman and she went and had her, you know, start her career. And then she decided that now was a good time to have a baby. And she was about 38 or 39. And she came into the office and said, it was, it was, uh, I think, early summer. And she said, I want to be pregnant by September. <laughs> she, she, had, she had everything planned out, you know, her, she had to fit this on her schedule. And uh, I said, well, you know, you may not get pregnant at all. You know, you're 38 years old, your, your fertility starts declining after age 35. And, you know, we'll do the best we can. And it uh, turns out, uh, this particular woman did become pregnant, but she didn't become pregnant in September. So, so she was kind of upset. <laughs> it was like November or December. And I was thrilled. I thought, wow, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very optimistic. Um, so that's, that's sort of a long response to um, the bottom line is um, you don't want to wait too long, and, if, and uh, ideally before age 35. Um, if I could just encourage people along those same lines, there's actually evidence that our fertility starts dropping in our 20s. And it's got a lot to do with the gametes, meaning the, the eggs and the sperm. <laughs> the, the eggs and the sperm uh, get older and are more susceptible to mutations and things like that. Now, um, I, could, I could also say that there seems to be a convention amongst NAPRO technology doctors um, that was fostered uh, by the thinking of Dr. Phil Boyle in Ireland, who is doing a lot of this NAPRO. He's doing, you know, five or ten times the pace that Mark and I are doing. And he says that between age 40 and 42, I'll encourage the couple, encourage them to go forward with NAPRO treatments. Between age 42 and 44, I'll go along with it. After age 44, I actively discourage them because the chance of miscarriage approaches 100% at that point. Of course, we hear people that have, you know, pregnancies and successful pregnancies in their older age, but those are very, very few and far between. So he actually would discourage them. And, 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 and I like that way of thinking. Having said that, it's up to the patient. And I have treated someone up to age 48. And I, I say that, you know, I'm not doing anything that's harmful to you or your potential baby. Um, but one more point is that these people, whether they achieve a pregnancy or not, they so much appreciate coming to NAPRO Technology Doctors because we're able to, um, first of all, uh, um, suffer with them. We appreciate their inabilities. We, we respect their losses, the, the, the event potential of having a baby and all the trouble that they've been through, so they appreciate that. Secondly, they appreciate hearing why they couldn't get pregnant. I picture these people at age 55 sitting on their porch, rocking back and forth in their rocking chair saying, well, at least we know why we couldn't get pregnant. Because the IVF centers are not interested in figuring that out for them. 
And so they go through their life saying, was it my problem? Was it his problem? We don't know. But when they come to the NAPROTECT doctors, they know. I have a 0% um, incidence of um, unexplained infertility. Whereas the IVF centers have 60 to 70% unexplained infertility. And the people like to know, and they can put it at peace. Uh, so I'll, I'll, fast, I'll uh, handle the next question. What do you know about the HPV vaccine? That will take me about 10 seconds to answer. <laughs> and, uh, no, but, um, and can it cause cancer? Can it cause infertility? And what is the Vatican's position about this? So, of course, I'm not a vaccine specialist, and I'm not a Vatican representative, uh, but let me try to answer it a little bit. HPV vaccine stands for human papilloma virus vaccine, okay, human papilloma virus. That's responsible for cervical cancer. Um, it's helpful to know that I think there's 21 different variations of that virus out there, and maybe even more than 21, and, but there's only so many that are responsible for cancer. There's about nine of them, if I remember right. I'm summarizing for you, so don't quote me on it. But, um, and they've been able to put a certain number of those subtypes of, vac of viruses into the vaccine. Now, when I say put viruses in, they're not live viruses. They're only a piece of the virus. It's like if you wanted to have your immune system attack this pitcher, they take just a piece of it. Or it's a killed vaccine killed virus, okay? So these are not live viruses, so you can't really get the infection from these vaccines. And in general, all of us are in favor of, of vaccinating your children and vaccinating adults. We're, we're decreasing the chance of pneumonia in senior citizens by vaccines. So vaccines are a good thing, and the Vatican would be behind that. The problem where the confusion comes in in the public is that uh, they used to use chicken embryos for most of the vaccine production. Now it has become cheaper to use human embryo cells in the vaccine production. So that's where the confusion comes in. And the Vatican would say, Bishop can correct me if I'm wrong, of course, the Vatican would say that, well, it's unfortunate that you're killing persons to save other persons. It's not right, that's usury. That's using a person for somebody else's good. That's not right, that's slavery, for instance. And, and you're killing in the process, so that's not good. So these, these, these human cell lines have come from either embryos or fetuses that, fetuses that were aborted or embryos that are in the, the IVF labs, and, and they're actually making money off of these cell lines, huge, huge amounts of money that came from one person that was destroyed to get those cell lines. And you remember President Bush um, really agonized over it and tried to prevent the creation of new cell lines. Um, so the Vatican would also say that please vaccinate your children, but it's unfortunate that these companies are doing this. So use your whatever's in your skill set to fight that. Write a letter. Anybody can write a letter to these drug companies and say, it's so sad that I had to vaccinate my child with something that was killed, uh, another person was killed for. Or petition. You see the marches in, in Baltimore, set up a march. You know, we can, we've got all kinds of uh, skill sets and resources in our grasp that we can use to try to levy against these companies. And that's what the Vatican says. He's, they said the death of that person was so far removed that please don't feel guilty about vaccinating your children because we want your children to be healthy. They've got talents and gifts for all of humanity and, and we want to foster those. We don't want them to die of these illnesses. So. I hope that answers the question. I didn't answer the question, does, does it cause cancer or infertility? There's no uh, possible way in my mind that these vaccines could cause cancer or infertility. I think of that one. Oh. Yeah, um, I got, yeah, that's my question. I just want to actually add on, is there any way, would you, in your opinion, promote that one? Because back in Ocala, Florida, um, in May, on May 20, they're going to have a symposium on this, on HPV vaccine, that they're going to actually kind of like, it's a kickoff, that they're going to start that one in, uh, to vaccinate the children, especially in schools. Because I was reading on that HPV, it will be, they will start that at the age of 12 to 14, 
And my concern, is there any um, bodily effects when the child goes to be an adult and ready for, you know, uh, to get married and get pregnant, is there any effect on that one for them? Or is there, there will be a misunderstood about HPV that they, they, they would feel that they are covered and they will push through to that um, action of being promiscuous because they thought they were being um, covered with cervical cancer and other things. Which you get a concept from the Right, I'll summarize that again for the tape. That there's the idea of are we promoting promiscuity? And then you also raise the idea of vaccinating in schools, sort of like a mandatory outside of the, pay, the parents' uh, control over their child's destiny. Um, and so first of all, the parents, uh, you know, we really need to foster the parents um, being in charge of their, their children's upbringing, education, medical decisions. We really need to foster that. And so if, if the um, vaccination in school just simplifies it for the parents, great. But if it's mandatory and against parents' rules, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's correct. We need to respect the uh, position of the parents. Um, the, the other thing about promoting promiscuity, you, you see I danced around that one. <laughs> um, of course, human papillomavirus is only one of dec numbers of uh, viruses and sexually transmitted diseases that you can get. And so to think that I received the HPV vaccine and therefore I can be safe is obviously a mistake. Um, it's also a mistake to think that the condoms are going to protect you. And certainly the, the hormonal contraceptives, contraceptives don't protect at all. So um, there's lots of mistakes that are being made, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't protect the children against um, cancer from preventing this vaccine, virus from setting up in their bodies that then corrupts the cells into becoming cancer cells. So if we can use a vaccine to help the immune system to be safe, then that would seem like a good idea. I could just add one, one thing, just a, on a practical level. If I'm talking to um, a mother and her 12-year-old, 13-year-old daughter in an exam room, you know, we'll talk about how human papillomavirus vaccine Gardasil um, will uh, protect them, as Paul said, against that particular virus, but there's a whole bunch of other ones that it won't cover. And in terms of the, the concern about promiscuity, uh, I'll say, well, you know, the only, if, if you have sex, if you grow up and have sex with only one person, and that person only has sex with you, then you don't need this. Unfortunately, your future husband, you know, may have had another sexual partner, and and hopefully, he uh, will uh, feel will repent of that and uh, not be involved in promiscuous behavior in the future. But the fact is that um, this man uh, will have, will still potentially carry the HPV virus from being with another person previously. And so, you know, we're, we're not encouraging, um, the, the, the practical fact is, is that um, they still have the potential to be exposed in the future. And so they, you know, they deserve to be, uh, to be vaccinated. We've run over our time, so uh, we're going to have to wrap this up. I want to thank uh, panelists for their for the answers to the questions. Thank you for those who uh, submitted these questions. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer all the questions that were submitted.